Food Heals Podcast, episode 110. For us, this is how we're raising our child with one parent who's a vegan and one who's vegetarian. That's how we're choosing to raise our children, and we're going to do our best, and we'll find out in 20 years if we did an okay job. (laughs) (laughs) Holistic Voice presents the Food Heals Podcast with your hosts, Alison Melody and Susie Hardy. Join the Food Heals Nation and learn the secrets to go from feeling unwell to healing yourself. Warning, side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, an increase in sexual activity, feelings of joy, cravings for kale and quinoa, and a spike in Tinder matches. In rare cases, people have experienced a strong desire to put down the Ben & Jerry's, get off the couch, and take a walk outside. If you experience any of these symptoms, tell your Facebook friends immediately. All right, welcome, Food Heals Nation. Thanks for joining us. I'm Allison Melody. And I'm Susie Hardy. Today's guest is Tim Page. Tim is a vegan entrepreneur, podcast superhero, and voiceover artist. And we met on the podcast cruise and bonded over business, drinks, karaoke, and of course, veganism. All your favorite things. I know, so fun. (laughs) (laughs) Tim is also a musician, father, and husband. He is passionate about opt-in pages, conversions, and email tips and tricks that help budding entrepreneurs turn their passion into a successful business. As an educator at Lead Pages, he helps people do what they love most. I know our listeners are going to love this episode. We're talking veganism, parenting, business, and just having a candid conversation with our friend and fellow plant-based entrepreneur, Tim. And if you are an eco-friendly business person like Tim or like us, and you are looking to green up your lifestyle, your home, or your office, then we've got you covered with Dr. Group's Green Living Kit. That's right. Dr. Group always has your back. The Green Living Kit will help you make your home a healthy home and your office a healthy place to Instagram from. Just kidding. We know. We know you're working (laughs) most of the time. This kit includes a test to test the safety of your water, improve your indoor air quality, and get the tips and information necessary to detoxify your entire home and office from the inside out. You cleanse your body, now cleanse your home with the Green Living Kit. Go to GlobalHealingCenter.com and use the coupon code FOODHEALS at checkout to get 20% off your Green Living Kit plus free shipping. Free shipping. Who doesn't want free shipping? I mean, come on. You know it's good when Allison sings. (laughs) Did I sing? I didn't even know. You did. Sometimes I sing and I don't know I'm singing. Sing the next line. Okay. um, The next stop, our interview with Tim. Oh, wait. We forgot to tell them about Patreon. (laughs) Oh, go. okay. Just kidding. You can also win a swag bag full of our favorite Global Healing Center products and books and other great stuff on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash food heals nation. Susie, how do they win that? They go to patreon.com slash food heals nation and they become a Patreon pa- patron? Patron. They, they become a patron on our Patreon account <laughs> at the Vitality Vixen level or higher. Yes. And exactly. the first 10 to do that get a swag bag. Swag bag. Susie sang. <laughs> I did. I never sang. And you know, we give good swag, so it's worth it. It's worth it. Patreon.com slash Food Heals Nation. And sing with me, Suze. Next, Next up, up, our, our interview, interview with Tim. Tim. That was so <laughs> off. Can we, can we cut that? <laughs> no, it's better this way. Off key. It's horrible. <laughs> Next up, our interview with Tim Page. I love how you did that in your best voiceover artist voice. (laughs) (laughs) The Food Heals Podcast starts now. Today we're here with an exciting guest, Tim Page. Tim is well known in many circles of solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, and online marketers who love his passion and drive. Yes, and he's also known as the kick-ass dude who brings us the amazing marketing tool, Lead Pages, and for hosting their podcast, Conversion Cast, where you can learn everything you need to turn your passion into your profit. He's a man of many talents. Before he got into the world of entrepreneurship, Tim was a touring musician. He even appeared on MTV and the Warped Tour. Wow, I can't wait to find out more. I know, that's really cool. Welcome, Tim. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. I I have to take one issue with your intro, though. Okay. Have you had the Ben and Jerry's almond milk? Holy heaven! Oh I'm just no, it is so good. I've had it. It's the vegan. There's four <sighs> flavors, and let me tell you that when we made that intro, that vegan ice cream didn't exist yet because we made yeah. that like a year ago, and now it's yeah. like all the rage. But I love. 
the Ben and Jerry's, the the cookies and cream one, or the it's like peanut butter and jelly one. Peanut butter and cookies. Oh, oh man, I have to like watch myself. Yeah, that's a problem. You know, <laughs> just have to be careful. But yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm pumped. Yeah, we're so glad to have you here. And you do so much. Like your file <laughs> is so extensive. You do voiceover. You're an entrepreneur. You work with lead pages. You're a musician. What what do you not do, Tim? Tell us. <laughs> Many things that, uh, I don't know, there are many things. I, I don't have anything witty. I, there's, there are many things I don't do. But the things I do, I love, and I only do things that I love. Absolutely. For the most. Yeah, and you're a father and a husband with a new baby on the way. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, we have, uh, we have a two-year-old boy now, and he is the craziest, most ridiculous, sometimes very frustrating, but 99% of the time, wonderful child ever and and yeah and then we've got another one on the way who i'm secretly hoping is a girl although it's not secret now oh you don't know yet no we don't know we're a little ways away but yeah i kind of hope it's a girl only because like we we still we had originally we're like we want five kids Mm -hmm. and now we're we're like well let's see what happens with this one (laughs) and then we'll decide (laughs) i feel like that's everyone's story all my friends that have had kids like that wanted a huge family are like you know what Two might be just fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I don't know what what causes the change. Not, I mean, we literally. I think having a kid is even better than I thought it would be, and like having another one is going to be really exciting. But we just want to make sure that it, it doesn't get to the point where like, well, two is two feels really great, and then all of a sudden we're shooting for three, and it doesn't feel. I don't know. We're just going to try it. But we do. I want to have a daughter. Definitely want to make sure that I have at least one daughter. As terrifying as that prospect <laughs> no. is. No. Uh, we're oh, wonderful. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I, I totally understand being like as a daddy being protective of your little Ugh. girl like I get that like you yeah. know your son's gonna handle himself he'll be okay but you know what boys are like and therefore you want to protect your little girl right that's exactly right yeah. yeah that's the the problem is not in the faith of my daughter it's it is in the faith of other people like me the when I was a kid it's like you know now I'm like you know respectable married man but you know as a, you know when you're a teenager oh god boys are the worst <laughs> just the worst hey girls too sometimes but oh boys are the worst and so I'm just like I just will want to kill everybody and I just that's just not who I am so we'll see what happens yeah I want a boy and a girl too for sure and then whatever else happens is good but I feel like that's kind of like the American dream you want one boy one girl and then the rest whatever (laughs) yeah and you know what if I if we have five boys that's fine too I you know I would love to have a daughter but I I don't care and and you know when when uh, my wife was pregnant with with Owen who's our son it was like you know, I, we both were, people would say, do you want a boy or a girl? I'm like, I really don't care. <laughs> I just don't care. I just want a little, like, pal that I can play with. And then at one point, you know, they'll hate me for a little while because that's what happens. Yep. And then become best friends when they're adults yep. and I'm old. So it's great. Oh, <laughs> <Aww. laughs> well, that's exciting. That's Congratulations. Like, that's the dream of my life. Yeah, thank you. So we met on the Podcaster's Paradise Cruise, which was this fabulous cruise where everyone was learning and teaching and it was just so much fun and you showed me this amazing thing that I had no idea was in existence because whenever I go out of town or I go on vacation it's really hard for me because it's hard for me to find food that I can enjoy that's also healthy and Mm -hmm. so Tim we went out to dinner with Tim and his wife my husband and I and he told me about the secret vegan menu on the cruise Oh, yeah. it was awesome. So we're sitting there and I was like, I'm trying to veganize everything. And Tim's like, well, actually, <laughs> here's the <laughs> secret. And it turns out you were like best friends with the with the head. I don't know what I don't want to. I don't know what she was. I think she was the a head waitress. Head waitress. OK, is that a term? I um, think so. <laughs> and, and she would he, they would plan the meals the day before. And the food was so good. Yeah, it was like I didn't want to eat anywhere else except for that one awesome restaurant. You know, we were eating at a lot of different places, but that one was like it was the best and it was so well prepared and they even had dessert. Mm -hmm. Like one night it was cake. I had vegan cake on vacation. When does that happen? Right. I know. Exactly. (laughs) Overseas, like in the middle of nowhere. (laughs) Yeah, it was great. Yeah, that was was great. The only other the only other place that's been as awesome for veganism that when I've traveled, um, besides when I like sought out the vegan restaurant was, um, was, uh, Disney. Disney had a lot of, we went to Disney world in Florida and there were a lot of vegan options, had to do a little digging to get there. But, uh, even when you got there, they had like, you know, they had like rice dream everywhere you went. That was pretty cool. It's growing. It is definitely growing. It's definitely becoming more available, I think. 
Yeah. I mean, you're not all yeah. the way there. There's always, But I go to restaurants and, you know, I always see like one, ve- you know, they'll put a little pepper or a, whatever they use as a little icon for the ve- marking yeah. the vegan dish. <laughs> yeah. Anytime I'm in a big city, I know I'm fine. It's really when I travel to the smaller towns, it's it's a lot harder now. But It is. It's better. definitely harder. Yeah. And I just remember, I, I'm just grateful anytime because, you know, now with stuff like Gardein and, and Field Roast and like these amazing, amazing vegan foods and Daya cheese, holy crap (laughs) um but like i remember when i first went vegan 13 years ago it was like you could have boca burgers which you know i'm grateful that they existed but they're not the best right and and they they did have one kind of vegan cheese it was called vegan rella i don't know if it's still out i dare not buy it (laughs) Um, but it was basically it had the taste of salty water and it felt like burning hot lava on the top of your mouth it was like Oh, I I need something to feel kind of like cheese if cheese was melted to the 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 temperature of lava. Right. But now it's like oh, there's pretty pretty good replacements. In fact, my wife, who is not vegan, she's vegetarian. She'll pick vegan options over vegetarian ones more often than not. Well, there's a lot of new, really good vegan cheeses that weren't around before, like Daya, Daya. I don't know how to say it, but has been around for a while. But there's so many new ones in the last two years. It's insane. Yeah, and it's great, and it's great because it means. You know, it means to me that there are more people who are not vegan who are trying these things and experimenting. And look, I, I'm I'm all for people choosing whatever works for them. Um, I'm not a, a judgmental or a preachy vegan at all. It's just what worked for me. But I love the idea that people are willing to just give it a shot. Like my dad, who is a hunter through and through my whole life. I mean, when I was a kid, I went hunting and all these things. And, you know, an outdoorsman, and that's just who he is. He has had some of the the vegan meat replacements. For example, the um, field roast hamburgers are incredible. Mm-hmm. And I gave him one of those, and he was like, you know, it doesn't taste like a hamburger, but it, it's good. Whatever it tastes like is, is awesome. And that being a... a a reality now, man, it's awesome. We have it so great for for the vegans in the world and even the vegetarians. Like, it's so great to be able to do that and try those things. And I, you know, I've got a lot of like elitist vegan friends that are like, you shouldn't eat those things. You should just eat vegetables and fruits. And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. But sometimes you want a hamburger. Yeah, and, and it depends on your goals and what is your intention behind eating this food and changing your diet yes. and changing your lifestyle. Exactly. Exactly. And so why did you 13 years ago decide to go vegan and why didn't you go back? Well, I think part of it was I had a lot of friends who were vegan and some of them were like, you know, really entrenched in the vegan movement. You know, I had friends that were on Sea Shepherd before that was ever a show. And, you know, I had like really great, strong vegan friends that knew how to make a great, compelling case. And they showed me the videos and I think that at that point it was like 75% for the animals, 20% for health, and like 5% to be cool. (laughs) There there is a cool factor, right? (laughs) Yeah. Now the cool factor has actually turned into the elite factor now, right? Mm -hmm. It used to be like, I'm a cool hippie or something, and now it's like, oh, I'm better than you. And that's so unfortunate because that's not how I see it at all. It's really sad, yeah. And it was a cool factor for me just because it was like all my friends are doing this and it's cool that they're doing it and I want to do the cool thing too. Yeah. <laughs> but but it was also like it was easy. People always ask me, was was going vegan hard? And, uh, and it wasn't, but I know that it wasn't because I was surrounded by other people who had already been vegan and it wasn't difficult. Like we had hangouts, you know, it was like I was – you know, pretty young and like we would have just the hangouts, play video games and somebody would go cook like a vegan casserole or something. And it's way easier to do it if that's the the case. Whereas, you know, some of my friends who live in, you know, these rural towns in the middle of the country where they've never met a vegetarian in their life and they decide they want to try it, it's got to be really hard. Yeah, it's so different. You're right. So what part of the country were you living in during this time? I, I have always lived in Syracuse, New York, which is not a big city, but it's a city. Right. And, you know, we have access to like one of the world famous grocery stores is Wegmans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have access to Wegmans, which has a whole natural section. It's not all vegan and vegetarian, but there's a lot of stuff there and it's easy to get there. And um, and and so, yeah, so it was pretty easy to get that stuff then. Now there's like there are two vegan restaurants in Syracuse. There are several vegetarian ones. So it's definitely gotten easier. And I think you you asked me a question earlier that I didn't answer. You said, why didn't I change? Uh, I actually, for about, I guess it was about a year, I actually went back to vegetarian because I was following a a friend who at the time was actually a butcher. 
uh, or he was a butcher, but he was he was a meat eater. He wasn't a butcher when we were friends, but he was a butcher, and then he was a meat eater, and he was a big, beefy, you know, muscular guy, and he trained people on how to build muscle and stuff. And I had gotten quite out of shape and quite unhealthy, mm-hmm. and I, I thought, you know, well, if I'm this unhealthy on veganism, and he's saying, you know, eat meat and do these things, maybe I should try vegetarianism and see if it gets better. Um, and it it didn't really, mm-hmm. and uh, and then he went vegan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how ironic. So. I had my lapse, but uh, but I I couldn't imagine ever eating meat. And I think at this point in my life, I know that I'll I'll probably never uh, change being vegan. And what about your son and your your son or daughter on the way? Are you going to raise them vegetarian, vegan? Do you not know yet? How do you make that decision? Yeah, well, so my wife is vegetarian, like I said, and so we're going to be we're raising them vegetarian. And part of the reason is because I don't believe that there's enough research out there. There is some and people will point you to it, but I don't believe there's enough research out there around how to raise a very young child Mm -hmm. on a vegan diet. Mm -hmm. Uh, It doesn't seem like it'd be that hard, but it kind of is. Uh, and so we're we're kind of we're doing the middle ground. We're going vegetarian, and then when they get a little bit older and they can make informed decisions, we're going to let them kind of choose for themselves. That's awesome. I think that's really great. Yeah, actually. I feel mm-hmm. the same way because like I know my husband thinks I'm going to be this really really strict, and I'm probably going to start out that way. But the truth is, is like I want to train them to make their own decisions, whether it's religion, politics, the food they eat, you know, who they believe in, who they're you know who they look up to. Like I hope it's me, and I hope it's him, but. You gotta let them make their own decisions, or no matter what you do, they're gonna rebel, right? Yeah, exactly right. It's like um, you know, I know people who were raised in the the strictest of households, and you know, they they weren't, you know, girls weren't allowed to you know go out on dates, and and all, they had these very strict rules, which uh, no judgment, but that was their thing. And then when they went off to college, it was like complete rebellion uh, completely went off the deep end drugs and everything and again no judgment but but just a, an observation that that is what happened uh, in in almost every case that I know of like that yeah. and so I feel like it's going to be the same way where if, if the kids you know if, if our kids are in social situations and we've we've kept them from doing these things when they have that temptation they're going to do it behind our back mm-hmm. I want to know and so if you can make that decision and you understand the ramifications at least to the extent that a very young kid can uh, and you want to make that decision all right but it's not you're not going to get it at home so <laughs> yeah I love that I feel like anytime with, with whatever with children and I do not have children yet but from my experience you know you make anything a forbidden fruit you tell them they have to be a certain way and of course they you know when they can, when they have that option to, and they get older and they have a bit of freedom they're going to go well I'm going to try it just because my parents said no yeah. Versus yeah. the way I was raised, uh, I was raised Catholic, and I'll use this as an example. My parents specifically did not want me to have shame around sexuality. I know this is a complete departure from veganism, but this is what, yeah, <laughs> yeah. just as an example, they didn't want me to, to feel that way. They didn't want to impose that on me just because that was our religion. And we were not good Catholics. We didn't follow the church that way. It was more of a spiritual thing, but that was our family background. But whenever you make something a forbidden fruit, and say they absolutely have to be a certain way, of course they're going to go try it because you're yeah. telling them, no, you can't have that. That's what kids do. I was with my friend's two-year-old yesterday. We were having swimming lessons. I nicknamed him Caesar because he was demanding things as <laughs> as the, the as toddlers do. And he had a French fry in his hand. And he, wa- and he loved the pool. And he walked to the edge of the pool and his mom said, don't throw that in the pool. And I could see, his, I could see his little fist rising oh, as wow. he was watching her. And she's like, don't put that in your mouth. Do not throw that in the pool. And it rose even. And then he, you know, he was being watched and he knew better. But if we weren't looking, I'm sure he would go back and throw it in the pool just because she said, don't do that. Absolutely. So. Right. It's like try not to think of like an orange cow. You have to instantly think of an orange cow. Yeah. There's nothing you can do to stop it. And kids are the same way, and 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 I think it, it applies the same way. Now, not everybody agrees, and that's fine. I've, I have a lot of friends that are now pregnant with with their what's going to be their first, and uh, you know I think when you are going to become a parent, everybody else that's already a parent wants to give you all their advice. Do this, try this. Do this. here's here's how you should do it. And the advice that we always give is to wing it. <laughs> and, and people hate that because they're like, oh, well, that's not that's no way to raise kids. But the thing is, people will say, you can never do this. You can never do this. You should always do this. You should always do this. And almost always those things change from day to day sure. when you're a parent. Everything changes all the time. And you just have to be willing to just 
roll with the punches. And so for us, this is how we're raising our child with one parent who's a vegan and one who's vegetarian. That's how we're choosing to raise our children. And we're going to do our best and we'll find out in 20 years if we did an okay job. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. There is no one way. I mean, I was a child psychology major in college and even from then, from what I knew then to what, you know, there's always new research. There's always new books. There's always new methods. There's always different ways of dealing with things. Human beings are complicated. And when we're little developing beings, we're even more complicated, right? So it is, I think that's great advice. I think you wing it, you do the best you can, you raise them with love and hope for the best. Yeah, it's not to say don't do not do research. It's not to say don't learn things, but it, it's always everything comes with a grain of salt. Advice is great when it comes with a grain of salt and you, you take it and go, okay, you're suggesting that. I mean, just as a, a funny example, one of, one of our parents always suggested, you know, oh, the best, the only way you ever slept was face down. <laughs> well, now the, the, the doctors say you should never put your baby's uh, face down because that's uh, a risk of SIDS. And so... It's that's what they knew. Those are the things, you know, give them a blanket, give them a Well, you can't do that with an infant, but that's what they did. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. things always change and you do the best you can. You you adapt. You try not to, you know, uh, like my my thing is for the first six months, you're just trying not to let them die. Yeah, like that's, seriously. <laughs> it's, it's morbid, but it's it's kind of like all I thought of for the first six months was like, don't let them die. Yeah. Don't let them die. Don't well, let them die. That, and it's doesn't like, that extend until like age five or something like that? I like, think so. Because once they I start getting extends. into like crawling and then picking stuff off the floor and walking. Yeah. At, electrical outlets yeah. it, it continues <laughs> it doesn't stop <laughs> yeah i think my mom would say that that never ends you know yeah. I'm, I'm 32 and she still thinks that probably she's trying to stop not let me die uh <laughs> with all this stupid crap i do so who knows all right Tim. so let's pivot and talk about your work life so you are an entrepreneur through and through and you do all these things musician you're a podcast host you work with lead pages i'm sure there's things i'm forgetting tell us about um why you got into this world you're a voiceover artist of course i think that's your number one so tell us about how you got into all these things and how you really sustain being an entrepreneur you know it's hard to say what's a number one there's so many things all the time what happened for me was that I uh, had always want. I'd always believed that you should only do what you really, really want to do. Mm-hmm. And I know that like many people will tell you that's impractical advice. And I think to some degree, sometimes it is impractical advice. But um, but when I was a kid, all I wanted to do was play music. Mm-hmm. I, I wanted to entertain people. That's what I always wanted to do. Um, yeah, I guess it was really that I wanted to entertain people. Music would just happen to be the thing that I gravitated to first. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I, I heard bands like, um, the most eclectic mix, like it was like the first things, I think it was tapes. The first tapes I ever owned were like Green Day's Dookie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That was a good one. I had that one too. Yep. Uh, the Eagles, Hell Freezes Over, Mm -hmm. which was like a compilation. And then Boys to Men 2. Like those were the three tapes. (laughs) What? Uh That was a surprising one. I love Boys to Men. (laughs) Yep, it, it was a weird one, but that was my uh, that was like my my introduction to music, mm-hmm. kind of. I mean, it was that was la- a little later, but that was like where what I listened to constantly. Yeah. and so I was like, I want to do that. I want to be on stage. I wanna I want to play music. So I started a band, started several bands, and most of them were terrible. And some people would say all of them were terrible. And then I. I started one band that actually kind of became like a family. We were called Honor Bright and we we toured all over the country. You mentioned it. We did like, we were on TRL. We got signed to a record label. We played Bamboozle and Warp Tour and all these amazing events. And, and we played, one of our, one of our highlights was uh, playing at Soma in San Diego, which is a world famous venue. And then we actually met Tom DeLong from Blink-182. I have a Blink-182 tattoo. So like it's for us, we were all freaking out. Yeah. And and we did all those things and and the reason I'm bringing that up is because at one point when that was coming to an end and it was like, I want to settle down. I want to, I want to, you know, get married and have a family and all these things. It was like, okay, now what, Mm -hmm. you know, I had been doing that. I'd been playing music for probably, I don't know, over 10 years and really seriously doing it for seven years. And I didn't know what to do. So I, I got into sales, which was something that helped me pay the bills when I was on tour and hated it because I was literally working 15 hour days, seven days a week, oh. which is so not healthy. Yeah. And in that time, I started to say, how can I figure out what's next? I know how to sell stuff, but I feel like the way many people sell stuff is, is really crappy. Mm-hmm. And, and I want to do something that I'm excited about and I want to entertain people and I want to make an impact. 
And so I started learning about online marketing because I stumbled into Pat Flynn's Smart Passive Income podcast. Yeah, he was one of my first entrants into this world as uh, well. Yeah. Uh, just amazing. And and the thing I loved about Pat, but which is, is probably the thing everybody loves about him, is that he's just so real and so honest. So real. We were just talking about we this. We were just Susie. talking yeah. about this. And I have not listened to this podcast yet. I'm going to. And that is exactly what Allison said. She's like, he is so honest and real. And he talks about his family and he talks about just think like he's a real person. He's not a sleazy salesman. And you got a lot of podcasters, unfortunately, and not just podcasters, but salespeople out there that you you start to trust and believe in. But then you realize they're really sleazy. And Pat Flynn has never gotten sleazy. I really appreciate that about him. Right. And the funny part is, you know, I've, be, I've become friends with him over the years. I've gotten to know him really well. And he is exactly who you would think he is. You, you listen to his podcast. You watch his videos. He's that. Yeah. That is him. Yeah just on recording. But I listened to his podcast and the thing that struck me about it that made me want to give it a shot was the first interview was uh, with a guy named Billy Murphy from Blue Fire Poker at the time. Mm -hmm. And the guy literally just had like, it was poker lessons. Mm -hmm. He was just like teaching people how to be good at poker and making a stupid amount of money. <laughs> and, and that was the thing he loved. He loved poker. And so he started a business having to do with poker and it was only online and he did it from home and he was really successful. And I went... You know, this this guy, Billy, might be really smart, but I can figure this out, too. Sure. And so I just went crazy learning how to do all of this online marketing stuff. I started my first podcast because I thought that was the coolest thing ever mm -hmm. to just, you know, to do what many people think is just talking, just like voiceover. Yeah, that's just talking, right? But I, I got into that, and, and that led me to voiceover and led me to lead pages, and it became like... I was like, man, I just love too many things. Uh, and I've started about 100 businesses since then and closed many of them, not because they weren't successful, but because I needed to really focus on the things that I loved the most. Mm -hmm. And that is right now, you know, voiceover, uh, webinars, and podcasting. Those are like the three things that I spend the most amount of my time outside of family time doing. That's awesome. So how many podcasts are you doing right now? Two. I have one, which is the official Lead Pages podcast called Conversion Cast, mm -hmm. and Every week we, we share one marketing tactic uh, that somebody can employ. It's like 10-minute episodes. They're really short and fast. And then uh, I have another one which I was doing weekly, and then I realized like I just don't have time to do it weekly because it's just something I do completely for fun right. called Getting Into Comics. And it's I'm, I'm, I love comic books. I collect. I read. I love it. And, uh, and it was basically helping somebody who loves the movies or loves the TV shows and wants to start reading comics but doesn't know where to start, it gives them kind of some guidance on where to start. That's very cool. And you started that one recently, right? Yeah, that's just a few months ago. I started a few months ago, and then I was like, okay, time to slow down on that one. Not going to do that weekly anymore. <laughs> yeah, you got to find your balance. you got to figure out what works. Right. And Conversion Cast right. is great because it's really simple and straightforward and to, the, and to the point. There's so many podcasts out there, including ours, which are hours long, you know, and then you, you, if you just want the tips, you have to listen to the whole thing and then write down tips. But in something that's short, 10, 12 minutes to the point, you get it all in 10 minutes. It's great. But it serves a different purpose, yeah, totally. too. It's, there's nothing wrong with a long podcast. I listen to a lot of them. In fact, I think I listen to far more long podcasts than short ones, but... When it comes to marketing stuff, I think it's really hard to listen to 45 minutes to an hour of, of somebody explaining complex marketing things yeah, and, then, sure. and then to have something to take away from it. It might be entertaining, but then at the end of the day, you, you didn't leave, a lot of the times you didn't leave much better. Whereas if I can spend 10 minutes and have somebody go, here's what I did, here's how it worked, here's how you can do it, and in 10 minutes it's done, you have something that you can then go and do. Love it. It's absolutely true. So what are some of the your, your favorite tips that you like to teach marketers or beginning podcasters or beginning people that are just starting their own business? What do you like to teach them? What's your advice? I would say to speak your audience's language. Mm. Too many times I find that people will go take some copywriting course or some marketing thing or some Facebook ads thing and they learn all these things that you're supposed to say, the right things to say to get somebody to buy. Um, and in sales, it doesn't work. And in marketing, it doesn't work. And in podcasting, it doesn't work. Marketing is not about saying some magic trigger where they get somebody to do what you want. It's about being able to speak the language of your prospective customer and show them that what you have can solve their problem or can enhance whatever it is that they that they are excited about. And there's many different so, ways. Would you agree with this? There's many different ways to actually do that. Yeah, totally. Because totally. because it's not like, you know, sales really sort of, my husband uh, used to have a pitch business. And so he knows all about pitch, nice. pitching 
And he made a lot of money doing that. And it's very psychological. And he would constantly reinvest himself into trying to figure out new ways, you know, always learning. And, yeah. and if you think about it, it really started with like carnivals and men like selling, pitching things and then like, you know, newspaper ads and things like that. And it's evolved and it's very tied to psychology. And, and therefore, there are different ways to do that. It's like the art of not selling, right? You don't want to, no one likes a hard sell. Some, right. some people might, but there's so, like, and I'm not, I've had to learn at being an artist, being a voiceover artist and a writer and an actor. I used to think that if I just do my craft, the right people will find me. No, 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 no. <laughs> you are always yeah. selling, whether it be just if you're in a type of uh, job where all you have to do is maybe do in your lifetime a few interviews, you're still selling your services, yourself, your talents. When I started to think that way, when I go into an audition, when we do voiceover auditions, when we um, even when we're putting our podcast out there, it is sort of it's offering up something of hopefully value that people will want to buy into, whether that be their time, their money, et cetera. Yeah. And when I started to really think that way, because I am not a born salesperson, I had tried it for side jobs a couple of times and ran, ran to the hills. I'm like, this is not for me. <laughs> but then when I met my husband and I was like, God, you know, always selling. You're always putting yourself out there, whether it be a product or yourself or your services, and then wanting something in return. And that's sales, yeah. right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And this is this is the thing I I uh, get I get in these debates with people all the time. Say, look, I'm not in sales. They go, I'm not in sales. It's like, well, yes, you are. It's just not you. You aren't a sales representative for whatever, right? But you're always you're doing some form of sales. Customer support reps are in sales because they're helping people to to accomplish a goal, so that then that person either stays a customer or whatever. If you are a I mean, gosh, you know this uh, as well as anybody, just like I do voice actors. I mean, look, we are we have to literally sell ourselves every single day, many, many times a day. If we're lucky, we get to try to sell ourselves many, many times a day. If you are a, a car mechanic, right, you have to sell why your, you know, your garage is the one they should go to as opposed to 700 million others. We're all in sales, but the, but the, the thing that always, almost always has in common is that somebody has to, to feel like you understand them and understand their problem. If they don't feel like you understand them or understand your problem, then the only reason they'll buy from you is just because you have a better price or because of convenience or lack of other options. And you don't want to be reliant on best price, convenience, or lack of other options. You want to be the the one that they go, oh, yeah, that solves my problem. Yeah. And it makes sense. That's very true. And it kind of reminds me of, of what happened to me personally is... I had a brand and I was posting articles, but they were, and they were authentically what I believed in, but they were very surface. They were very um, well written and I, there was no curse words and there was no personality infused and it, yeah. and it wasn't doing very well. But my videos on YouTube where I would interview people and I'm interviewing people who had, you know, changed their lifestyle, became a vegan, healed themselves of diseases, like all kinds of things that people could really resonate with. And they're hearing true stories from real people crying on camera sometimes telling their truth. Those were getting thousands and thousands of hits. But my writing was getting almost nothing, you know, and the YouTube's getting right. all these comments and everything. And the, the writing is just like sitting there just as a as a business card, basically like, like, oh, I write a blog, right? Right. <laughs> and it wasn't until Susie and I started the podcast that it all catapulted because these are our authentic voices. And although we're not selling anything, Tim, like you said, we're solving people's <laughs> problems because we are interviewing people who have overcome something, let's say, and they have the answer that the listener is looking for, right? And so by being our authentic selves, telling our stories, telling uh, being a platform to tell other people's stories, we have created this really engaged and informed and, and interested audience who we can sell to. And Susie and I actually don't sell a lot. We're working on some things, but... Ali, admit it. You just needed me. I did. Absolutely. I was the secret was ingredient. It. Oh, my God. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm super humble. <laughs> Problem solved. No, I'm kidding. No, you're not. It's very true. <laughs> no, I am. You No, I'm joking. No, it's so true. But yeah, I mean, it's really just about, like you said, it's about being authentic and that will shine through more than the sales. But you still got to sell. You're still selling yourself. <laughs> People right. don't and like you. Goodbye. Yeah, and it's not to say either that you have to be one certain personality type or another. You know, so I talk about a lot with uh, with podcasters. 
you know, or people that want to start a podcast and they say, you know, how can I make sure that my show is successful? And I, I always say, well, you can't, but one of the ways that you can be as, as, uh, give yourself as best a chance as possible is to be entertaining. And they always go, oh, well, I'm not like a funny person. And I, I always say, well, you know, I'm not necessarily a funny person either, but it, entertaining is doesn't mean funny. It just means that, you know, somebody has to have a reason to want to listen to your show. Like I'll talk to people that say, well, I'm introverted. I probably shouldn't start a podcast. It's like, no, but you should, you should, if you want to start a podcast, you should, but be yourself on that podcast. When I hear introverts go, Hey, welcome to blah, blah. And I'm like, I know that's not you. Right, right. You can, you feel it. It literally, you can feel how much it hurts them to, to do that. And oftentimes when people are, Almost all the times when people are inauthentic, you can tell, and it's it's almost like magnets repelling each other. Like yes. y- you can really sense that, oh, that's not who you really are, and you're trying to be something, and I feel like like that takes away a level of trust. Like if you aren't being your true self, what else are you keeping from me? Oh my God, that's so true. And my advice to introverts, because I'm more introverted than extroverted, absolutely, is podcasting is the perfect medium for you because introverts don't want to be at a party saying their opinion to people. Introverts don't want to be on camera because they're camera shy. Introverts can thrive at a podcast, can truly find their voice in a podcast because there's no judgment here. It's like just a different medium. But it's still putting your voice, i.e. you, out into the world. And the reason I say this is when I was in college, I studied abroad in Italy and I went to visit a friend in Sweden who was hosting a radio show. And I had done voiceover and I was an actress. I had done stage but for whatever reason, he brought me to his radio show uh-huh. and he's like, this is just a, co- a Swedish college radio station. We're just going to talk. We're talking about rock. We're talking about music. They love it. You know, it's an American voice. I get up there. He's like, come on, say something. And I shut up like a clown. Oh, yeah. And I had <laughs> your first and- experience is the worst experience. <laughs> well, no, but I had done voiceover. I had done one for the, the NBC Olympics when I was 14. I'd done stage. I'd studied in New York. And for whatever reason, I but I always considered myself still an introvert. And so... I can totally understand, uh, we've even had guests on here, that it takes a little while to warm up because even though we're just sitting in our studio, we're chilling out, we know that there's no judgment, um, they still think like, I'm putting myself out there and I can kind of understand where yeah. they're coming from. However, I fully agree. It's like, you gotta, if, that's, if this is something you're called to do and you want to do, it's something you gotta get over. It's a great stepping stone. It is. Definitely. All right, we'll be right back to talk to Tim about how you can build your business with podcasting and webinars. Today's show is sponsored by the Global Healing Center. You know them. We talk about them all the time. You know that all their products are organic, are free of GMOs, use no toxic ingredients, are eco-friendly. And you know that I'm obsessed with their Parfait Visage. And I'm obsessed with their Aqua Spirit Refreshing Spray. And you know we scored a discount code for you to get 20% off of their products. Yep. Use coupon code FOODHEALS to get 20% off plus free shipping on your purchase at Global Healing center.com all right food heals nation we're back with entrepreneur tim page tim hosts the getting into comics podcast a show dedicated to demystifying the world of comic books and helping people navigate through the thousands of different choices available and tim will be teaching podcasters at podcast movement and you've got quite a few topics you're going to go through so can you talk about how people who have a business right now or starting their business can really bring it up to the next level by podcasting. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're we're doing. I'm doing two things. So I'm going to be on a panel uh, with some really wonderful folks, folks from the team over at Aweber and Carrie Olson, who is a wonderful voice actress and also has a, an amazing business. And all these amazing people. We're going to be up there, and we're going to be talking about that as a panel and kind of sharing our thoughts on how to do that. The way that I have found is best is is really one of two things. So. You know, a lot of people are sending people to Facebook groups from their podcast, which is great. Uh, A lot of people are directly selling from their podcast or telling people to subscribe and rate and review on iTunes. All those things are fine. But what, what we've really found to be the most successful is to either drive people to subscribe to your email list or to get them on a webinar, which subsequently gets them on an email list. Uh, but it's interesting because for a long time we were focusing on just list growth, like trying to get our listeners, you know, we were, we were getting all that brand loyalty and stuff, but then we also wanted to get them on our email list and we did that and we had some success and eventually they became customers. But 
when the magic really happened was when we started saying, look, you know, you've been listening to this tactic and you're looking to grow your email list. Well, I'm going to be doing a live webinar this, I don't know, Thursday at 3 p.m. And I'm going to walk you through step by step live. You'll be on the call with me live. It's not pre recorded, it's not some weird thing, but we'll actually be live. I'm going to be showing you exactly how to grow your email list. And I'll walk you through step by step exactly how we do it here at Lead Pages. And so register for the webinar. Here's the link, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. And we were sending people to a webinar. And what we found was that people that bought, uh, or I'm sorry, the people that attended a webinar that had listened to the podcast, not only were more likely to buy, but also were more likely to buy at a higher price point. Mm. So it was really interesting. And I think what it comes down to is this. They're listening to your podcast. They've built this relationship with you. And I'll just to speak to that point, think about how many podcasts you listen to where you feel like you know the host. Yes. You know what I mean? You walk up to Pat Flynn, you feel like you already know him because you've listened to a, a bunch of his podcast episodes and he's in your ear and he's telling you stories of his life and you're meeting these people and hearing what he did. You're like, oh my God, and, that's my best friend. And they're like, whoa, who are you, buddy? <laughs> yeah, they're like, I'm sorry, who are yeah, you again? Exactly. Um, yeah, that's that's me everywhere. Me too. People, I'm sorry, who are you again? Um, <laughs> no, I'm the so, one that's like, hey, bestie. <laughs> you're like, back off. <laughs> back off, Jack. Um, but, you know, so you get that connection from the podcast and then you ask them to come be with you live when they can actually interact with you. They can actually ask you questions. You are showing them something that was a natural fit from what you brought them to on the show, on the webinar. And uh, and at the end, you say, look, I hope you've gotten a lot of value out of this. Uh, and if you want to take this to the next step, here's my whatever product that I have to offer. If it makes sense for you, I've got some bonuses. Um, and that is really, for us, that's been kind of the magic ingredient for making a podcast more than just content for making it actually help you grow your business. Yeah. And you gave me a really great example on the cruise. And I hope I'm remembering this correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong, but about a superfood brand that you had worked with and they had really jumped in numbers because of doing webinars. Yeah, that's it was a it was actually a vegan, uh, a vegan fitness company. Okay. And yeah, and they so they were they were doing webinars. It wasn't from a podcast, but they were promoting a webinar. They were not doing a webinar before they met me. I suggested it. We built one together, mm-hmm. uh, and they started doing a webinar and literally just exploded. They went from nothing to I think their first one was six figures. I mean, not uh, not six figures from one webinar, but uh, it put them on pace for six figures for the year from one webinar. And Tim, how much are you going to charge us for our webinar? Because we're about to hire you. <laughs> Four hundred thousand. Amazing. Yeah. Four hundred thousand yen? yen? Did he say yen? Clams? Yeah. Four hundred thousand yeah. clams. We'll take it. We'll go clamming. We'll get you some clams. <laughs> Six garden veggie burgers. We can do Done. that. Done. We'll give you ten. <laughs> you know, Susie's from New York too. Oh, nice. So she'll bring you some garden. I'm a Long Islander. Oh, okay. I'm far, far away from there. <laughs> yeah, you're far, not far that away. far. You're a d- far from th- from that intrepid place. You're a day's drive. <laughs> <laughs> it's like six hours. <laughs> Okay, so basically you're finding that webinars are able to really increase people's conversion rates, right? Yes. Yeah, and it it, it, again, it's it's um we talk about naturally selling. It's such a natural step. You're not asking somebody to go from, you know, I found somebody linked me to a blog post, and then you want me to buy your two thousand dollar program. You've gotten to know them. Yeah. You built that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I totally hear that. And I've been on plenty of webinars and I've totally purchased. Susie and I just haven't done any webinars because we're just not there yet. Um, So we'd love your advice on that in the future. But what are some examples of platforms that can be used to do a live webinar? I know there's like Google Hangouts. Is is that something Lead Pages does? Like how how does someone start if they're like, I have a great idea for a webinar, but I don't know what technology is available for me. What would you recommend? Okay, so if anybody from GoToWebinar is listening, anybody from Citrix, please, please go ahead and hit stop right now and don't listen to the rest of this talk. Okay, uh, so we at Lead Pages use GoToWebinar. Okay. And it is because we've been using GoToWebinar for a long time. However, I would not recommend that for most folks. Uh, even people that, that have had a lot of success with their business, I would not encourage you to use GoToWebinar. What I would encourage you to do is one of two things. Either if you want to go the least expensive route possible, which is totally okay, you can, if you're a Lead Pages customer, this will work. If not, it won't. If you're a Lead Pages customer, you can do a Google Plus Hangout on Air video on a Lead Pages page designed specifically for that. It will have a call to action button below the video, and there will be a chat box right there on the page. The chat box is free. 
and Google Plus Hangouts on Air are free. That's one way to do it. The way I would recommend for for the other option is there's a tool called Webinar Ninja, mm-hmm. and you know I think you you heard Omar speak. You know, Omar and Nicole yes. at uh, on the cruise. I did, but and, Food Hills Nation did not. <laughs> right. Sorry. Yeah. And so that's who I was addressing. I wasn't addressing everybody. You were all there. Um, you remember. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Webinar Ninja is it's it is the easiest to use webinar platform I've ever seen. And we don't use it at Lead Pages because I just haven't been able to get them to say yes yet. But it is just it's so simple and it doesn't use Google Plus Hangouts. But Tim, didn't you just say use Google Plus Hangouts? Okay, I did. <laughs> if you're looking for a free way to do it if you're already a Lead Pages customer, but Google Plus Hangouts on Air has uh, like a 30 second lag, meaning when I say something, you hear it in 30 seconds which is really frustrating, especially if you're, you're asking people questions and interacting. Webinar Ninja doesn't have that, and it's all in one. Everything you need is there. Uh, I, I seriously love Webinar Ninja. That's what I recommend for everybody. No, that's great information because it's like right now I'm going through all, there's so many options for everything you want to do these days, and you're reading reviews, and you don't know who to trust. So I like learning things from people that I trust. Well, anytime they put Ninja in the name, I think you kind of have to trust them because that's pretty <laughs> badass. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. I've uh, I've decided that I want to put superhero on all of my branding. So that is perfect. I, I do a lot of uh, of promos Tim, in voiceover. I have That's, a question yeah. for you. Do you have a yeah. Do you have a cape collection at home? Because I feel like you might. <laughs> I wish I did. I think I don't. you should start one at least for your children. I'm thinking about yeah. it. I'm thinking about. It. I, we do have many costumes, but they are for girls because my wife got them at. She got them for a penny at a toy store. Oh, so cool! Yeah, so we're saving them. But yeah, no, I um, that's that's one of my one of my things. I do a lot of promo and voiceover, and, and promos for anybody who doesn't know is like it's commercials for a TV show. So it's like you know tonight on Fox. Um, but I I do a lot of that. So I I had to buy the domain the promo superhero dot com. I just had to. Oh, I love that. That's perfect. <laughs> I don't use it for anything, but I have it. So can you give us some? <laughs> Can you give us some examples of, and I'm putting you on the spot and I apologize, so you can say no, but can you give us some like superhero voiceovers? Some examples? If I, if only I did superhero voiceovers. <laughs> all, all my stuff is like, I don't do much character work. I'm just like the boring guy. You know, all really? my stuff is like, yeah, I do a lot like... Yeah, I do promos for like the UFC. So I guess the the voice that I do for them is always like the UFC 196. You know, it's like really deep. Give me a, in, a wor- in a world, just go. Oh, God, it's so bad. In a world. <laughs> that's that's good. It's so good. <laughs> that was good. That was good. I like that one. Yeah, I do I do a lot of stuff for the UFC. I do some stuff for the CW, which is much more fun. It's like, you know, uh, it's really high and up here, the CW, because it's meant for teenagers. Of course. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's my area of fun. One of my clients, I'm trying to branch out and, and do a couple more things for them. And the, the biggest thing they keep saying, and this this is so applicable in so many places in business, is that they, I've auditioned for many other things for them, for this network, and oftentimes it's not that they don't hire me because they thought my audition was was not good enough. Like a lot of times, they think that I sound great, but they're just like, ah, for easiness, we're just going to use the same guy we've been using. Mm-hmm. And it's just like ah, that's sometimes that's how business goes. But yeah, you want to test your resolve, become a voice actor, see if you really want it because <laughs> there's so much rejection. But I love it. So um, what are some of the podcast intros you've done? Because I know that's a big bulk of your business, right? Like who, whose podcast yeah. is well known that we would know? Yeah, I mean, I've done uh, Entrepreneur on Fire. John Lee Dumas. Um, yeah, the James Altucher Show. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did the Founder Magazine podcast. Uh, I did, I've done a lot. You know, I think I've done, now I think it's 700 podcast intros and outros in the last three years. Oh my God. So I do a lot of podcast intros and outros. It's it's pretty much that and promos are 95% of the voiceover work I do. I love that. And Tim offered us one, Susie, but it was when we already had ours finished So because we had already started this podcast. But I'm going to hold him to it for the next one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to I'm gonna do the whole thing like a teenage boy. Okay, cool. Now I want you to do I, it like a just, superhero. Just, uh, do it. I can do it like a superhero. <laughs> yeah. Say you're listening to the Food Heals podcast with Allison Melody and Susie Hardy in your best, funniest voice. I'm just going to say you're listening to the Food Heals podcast. Fine. <laughs> in, my, in my best, fun, in my funniest No, do it like a vampire. A, you're listening to the Food Heals podcast. That was horrible. No, no, not a, it was so bad. I don't know what, are you what that doing? was. I love 
loved him. You know better than that. That, that was horrible. Commit. You got to commit. Do you know how many auditions I've been to, voiceover auditions, back in New York when you actually had to go into the studio? I don't know when the last time you had to do that. They don't really do that as much anymore. But yeah. Never. Go into, the, go into the studio and then be like, do it like a baby. Do it like Marilyn Monroe. Do it like a crocodile. Do it like a parrot. Like they put you through the ringer. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My my favorite is when they go, we want you to do it, and if you screw up, we want you to keep going. And then I often will screw up, and then I'll go, I'm going to do it again. And then I'll go to say the first word, and I'll choke, and then I'll laugh hysterically, and then I just read the take. And because I was just laughing, it was like the best take ever because it was really natural. That's that's how it always works. That's, if you could just figure out how to get a natural take the first time, oh man, I mean, that's that's magic. That reminds me of a photograph, right? If you're just smiling for a photograph, no one looks authentic. But if someone makes a joke and you're laughing, and the photographer takes it right at that moment or right oh, after, so it's, absolutely, it's the best picture you've ever like taken. It's like the face that we try to put forward versus just being natural in ourselves and in the moment. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. All right, Tim. Thank you so much for being here. Where can everyone find you online? Find you on your podcast. You have multiple podcasts. Hire you for voiceover. Tell us everything. Oh, my gosh. If you are a marketer, check out leadpages.net or check out the podcast conversioncast.com. If you want to check out some voiceover stuff, my non-podcast stuff is at thevoiceoftimpage.com. If you uh, want some podcast voiceover, it's at makemyintro.com. What up, branding? And then, <laughs> what up? <laughs> and if you want to get into comics and and check out, um, you know, how to get into it without all the overwhelm and craziness of trying to figure out what to do, check out gettingintocomics.com. Love it. Thank you so much. This has been so much fun. I will see you at Podcast Movement. Will Sarah be there? She will not. She'll be home with the babe. Oh, we'll send her our love. Tell and her the one hi. in the oven. And the one in That's the oven. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, developing a more positive outlook on life. In rare cases, women have experienced a strong desire to stop asking their boyfriends if they look fat in this dress. If you experience any of these symptoms, post a selfie to Instagram immediately.